word, 1 Peter chapter 1, reading in verse number 18. I'm reading from the King James this morning. Love the, the insight that the King James brings us, 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says this, verse number 18, For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed, if you like to underline in your Bible, I'd encourage you to underline that word, redeemed. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, notice this, but with the precious blood of Christ. Boy, if I was Peter, I might have had to stop right there and shout for just a little while. Not with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. But with the precious, somebody say the word precious. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you so much. God, for what we feel in our souls this morning, God, thank you so much, Lord, that, that you did go to the cross. And that cross is our means of victory today. Lord, what the enemy meant for evil, God, you took, turned it around for good at the cross of Calvary. And Lord, we just thank you for your promises. God, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was spilled on Calvary. And God, we know that we're living in an era where where churches are no longer preaching about the blood. And, and God, the, the, they're, they're publishing uh, bloodless hymnals. And, and God, they're trying to take the cross out of the message. And, 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 but Lord, we look to the word of God this morning and we see the message of the blood. And God, we see the preciousness of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that you would convict our hearts, God, if there's conviction that's needed. God, that you would encourage our hearts if encouragement is needed. Lord, you know the depths of who we are. God, you know every hair upon our head, and Lord, that you would might speak to us individually. Lord, you know every man, woman, boy, and girl that's assembled here this morning. So Lord, do the work that only you can do, and Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Notice what Peter says about the blood. I love the adjective here. The word that Peter uses to describe the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not believe that any word in Scripture is there by accident. I believe that every word of God is there by the inspiration. This is what theologians describe as the plenary verbal inspiration of God. That every word, not just every verse, not just every chapter, not just every book, is inspired by God, but every word in Scripture is inspired by our God. Amen? And notice the word that Peter uses to describe. Now, he could have just said that you have been redeemed with the blood of Christ. Amen? But notice that's not what he did. Notice the word that he uses to describe the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it is precious blood. Notice that he doesn't say it's powerful blood. Which it is. Would anybody agree that the blood of Jesus is powerful? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. Amen? But that's not the word. That's not the adjective that Peter uses to describe. Notice he doesn't say it was the pure blood of Christ. How many know that it is? How many know that he's as of a lamb without spot? Or without blemish. He doesn't say that it's powerful blood. He doesn't say that it's pure blood. How many know it doesn't say that it's perfect blood? Which it is. It is the perfect, it is the incorruptible blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the blood of the Lord Jesus is not tainted. But notice what Peter uses to describe the blood. He says that it is precious. In the Greek word, in the Greek text, the, the, the word Greek, uh, uh, word precious here is timios. Now that doesn't mean anything to you, but, but it's found 13 times in the New Testament. And this is what timios means. It means something that is valuable. Anybody believe that the blood is valuable? 
It means something that is costly. Anybody here this morning believe that the blood was costly of the Lord Jesus Christ? It means honored or esteemed. How many know the blood of Jesus Christ is valuable to us which are saved? How many know the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? He spilled it out on Calvary and salvation is free. But how many know that it was very costly this morning? How many know the blood of Jesus is honorable? How many know there is no blood like the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? And how many know that the blood is esteemed? And and I can appreciate what Peter is saying here about the precious blood. He's saying that it is valuable, that it is costly, that it is honored, and that it is esteemed. How many know there's no blood like the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? This is why Peter says that you have been redeemed, not with the corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is it that makes the blood so precious? If you're a note taker, uh, jot this down. Number one, the blood redeems. The blood redeems. First Peter 1 and 18, you are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. But with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so in order to really appreciate that text, I think that we need to understand what does it mean to redeem? What is the word redemption? We talk about that Jesus redeemed us. We talk about that, that we have been, that our redemption has been bought by the blood of Christ. But what does the word redeem actually mean? What, what it actually means is to buy back. The word redeem means to buy back, and it also means to deliver by payment of a ransom. In order for us to really appreciate that, we need to understand what does it really mean that God bought us back by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you need to first understand how many know that God owns us at creation? How many know we're not our own? God did not, uh, listen, when God created us, we belong to Him. Amen? We are the creation of God. You are not a byproduct. Uh, of evolution that you are not here by accident God in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth how many know God owns us at creation we belong to the Lord we are God's creation we are the centerpiece Uh, we are the crowning of all God's creation everything else that God created only man was created in the image of God and in the likeness of God so how many would agree that because God created us he owns us In the book of Isaiah, in the 53rd chapter, Isaiah gives us a messianic prophecy. And and, and there in verse number 6, this is what Isaiah prophesies. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned to our own way. But God has laid upon him, Jesus, talking about the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. And so what what Isaiah is saying is that even though God owns us at creation, we have each went our own separate ways, that we have went astray, but Jesus bought us back at Calvary. But God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And so what Isaiah is saying is that we went astray, but Jesus bought us back. Is anybody thankful that when you went astray, that Jesus bought you back by his precious blood? We have another picture in scripture of this this is a picture of the redemption of God and what it means to buy back and it's found in the book of Hosea Hosea married a wife by the name of Gomer and the Bible says that Hosea loved Gomer and he loved his wife but but the scripture teaches that if you study the first two chapters of Hosea that 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 Gomer leaves Hosea and, and she enters into the market and begins to sell herself and prostitution how it broke Hosea's heart because he had a deep love for his wife he had a he had an unconditional love for his wife and instead of writing Gomer off the spirit of the Lord speaks God speaks to the man of God and he says go back to the market and purchase your wife go purchase her with pieces of silver You know what Hosea did? How many know that that, that Gomer was already his wife? 
How many know that he, that she was already his because of the covenant? But she went astray, and so what Hosea does, instead of writing her off, he goes into the marketplace and he purchases her. So what he does is he buys her back. Aren't you thankful that God didn't write us off in our sin? Aren't you thankful that God didn't just say, you can go your separate ways, you can do your own thing? No, just like Hosea loved Gomer, God loved us enough to go to the cross of Calvary, spill his blood and redeem us at the cross of Calvary but how many know that it costs something how many know that 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 Hosea just couldn't go to the marketplace and say give me my wife back how many know that there was a a ransom that had to be paid how many would agree that that he had to go with with the change in his pocket he had to go back with the silver listen and understand do not misunderstand what I'm saying salvation is a free gift from God it's not of works lest any man should boast. But listen to me, salvation wasn't cheap. The blood that Jesus crossed, it is, the, 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 the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross, it is costly. It is valuable blood. And Jesus, listen, sometimes I think that we get gospel hardened. Sometimes we think about the blood and we don't understand all of the suffering that the Lord Jesus Christ went through to redeem us at the cross. If you're thankful for the blood, shout a big amen this morning. Notice what Romans 3 and 24 and 25 says. We are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That we have been redeemed by his blood to be received by faith. Understand, it took the shedding of blood to redeem us. If God could do it any other way, God would have done it some other way. But this is God's plan all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, the covering for Adam and Eve's uh, uh, their, their sin and, and their rebellion against God. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. God rejected the covering of the flesh. And so what did God provide? He provided an animal skin covering for Adam and Eve. Guess what? Blood had to be shed for the animal skins to cover Adam and Eve. And we see that on the night of the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, blood had to be shed for the covering of God's people. On the day of atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, blood had to be shed. The sacrificial system that God established throughout the book of Leviticus, blood had to be shed. Colossians 1 and 20 tells us this, and through him being Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Hebrews 9 and 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's a good thing to remove the blood from the Bible. Amen. I think we still need to sing the songs about the blood. I think we still need to preach about the blood because without the shedding of Jesus' blood, there's no redemption. If you believe it, shout a big amen. The blood redeems. But not only does the blood redeem, and that's good, and, and we had to be bought back, and Jesus paid the ultimate price. But the second thing I want you to see is that the blood cleanses us. It just doesn't redeem us. See, the redemption deals with our standing before God. God brings us back into right standing. But the the cleansing refers to our sanctification before God. How many know that God's also worried about our sanctification? Not just our standing before him. And the power and the preciousness of the blood of Jesus is that it accomplishes what the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could never accomplish in the Old Testament. See, in the the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices were, notice this, temporary coverings for sin. But the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus provides a permanent cleansing from sin. I want you to think about the difference between a temporary covering and a permanent cleansing. See, that's the difference between the blood of bulls and goats, is that the blood of bulls and goats provided the temporary covering, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ provides the permanent cleansing. How many know there's a big difference? Go ahead and put that up there if you would on here. Take a snapshot of this. This is the difference between the blood of bulls and goats And the difference between the blood of the lamb. 
See, this is why the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is precious blood. Because it accomplishes what the blood of bulls and goats could never accomplish in the Old Testament. It was just a temporary covering. That's why the Day of Atonement had to happen every year. Yom Kippur happened every single year. Why? Because there was just a temporary covering. But in Jesus Christ, when Christ died on Calvary, he didn't just provide, aren't you thankful? He didn't just provide a temporary covering for our sin. He provided a permanent cleansing for our sin. See, God just didn't do something about our external standing before him. God started doing something about our internal state before him. A covering takes care of the outside. Cleansing starts showing up on the inside. How many know Jesus' blood does something that the blood of bulls and goats can't accomplish? As an illustration, God gave me this idea this morning. And I I, want to kind of drive home to you. I want you to, to be able to see firsthand the difference between a temporary covering, and a permanent cleansing. Hey, that baby's all right. That baby ain't going to hurt anything. There'll be more crying than that after this service. Somebody shout a big amen. Amen. How many know that soda in the sanctuary isn't such a good idea? Amen. How many know that soda can stain the carpet? But ha- What's that? But how many, uh, she's all right. Uh, how many know that, that soda can stain? And soda, listen, if you don't deal with soda, and, and, and I, I just wanna, want you to see a little something. I got a spill there. How many know that accidents happen? Amen? Are you judging me that that wasn't an accident? Do you know the motive and the intent of my heart to know that that wasn't an accident? So I, I've got, that was an accidental spill, wasn't it? Oh, you're judging me, man. Don't judge not lest you be not judged. I got two stains right here. How many know they're, 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 they're the exact same? They're not the same size, but they're both soda stains. This is Dr. Pepper, amen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Brother Tim. Tim, would you come here real quick? Now, I don't know about you, but I appreciate this man of God right here. Tim is, hey, listen. Tim, Tim is, uh, he's the one that cleans all your mistakes up every week, amen? But, but one thing that, that I want to tell you about Tim is that while he is cleaning the church, he does it with a smile on his face. He loves God, and, and, and he serves the Lord. And so while he was back there, he was probably having a heart attack while I was doing this. I mean, man, I, I could have put him in cardiac arrest there. Okay, and so, Tim, what I'm going to ask you to do is I, I've given you uh, just a, a bucket here. I've got a, a bucket of water, and, and I don't know. Man, I, I don't clean very well, so I've got a bucket of water. I've got a, if you could help me out here, Tim, I've got a scrubber. You can pick either one, and uh, you can, he's smiling. How many know the stain's there? So Tim's down there. Man, I appreciate, listen, I, I really, I, I want to go ahead and tell you how much I appreciate Tim and his service and, and vacuuming 40,000 square feet and, and the time and the efforts that he puts in to cleaning up the gym on a weekly basis. And man, that was quick, Tim. Hold on one second here. No, I'm just. Okay, so, so thank you. Everybody give Tim. Let him know you love him and appreciate him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to blend in a little bit here that the carpet's blue this is blue how many know that now Corbin come on up here real quick you after Tim got done do you see any stain there what happened so did it get clean does that look clean to you looks cleaner than before he scrubbed it amen does this look clean to you you, does it look clean right there? Do, does that look clean? It looks clean? Okay. The question is, is it really clean? Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Is it really clean or has it just been covered up? Is it really stained because it doesn't give the appearance? 
Right now, you can't see the stain, can you? But is the stain there? It's there. And I want to say something. The blood of bulls and goats, all it does is cover, but the stain's still there. But how many know, just to my right, there's something special about the hands of Tim? How many know there's something special about the blood of Jesus? Listen, every one of you, every single one of you can come up here. The stain's gone. Listen to me, it's not there. Aren't you thankful that Jesus' blood, he took away the stain of sin. It's no longer there. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sins. It's gone. It's not there. The power and the preciousness of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead and shout. Go ahead and glorify God. Because without the blood, your sin stains would still be there today. Hallelujah. For the preciousness. You say, man, why did Peter say the blood was precious? Because the blood cleanses us. Uh, 1 John 1, 7 tells us that the blood cleanses us. Man, I'm telling you, the hymn, hymn writer had it right. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sometimes we sing songs we don't even know what we're singing. What can what? Wash away. What can what? What can what? How many of y'all think the hymn writer was talking about the cleansing there? I think the hymn writer was referring to the work of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the blood that the Old Testament goats and bulls could never accomplish. It kind of reminds me, heard a story about a little girl who got saved, and, and after hearing the gospel, she was asked what ha- happened to her. And she was fumbling around for words, and she was trying to, to really describe what had happened to her, and she finally spoke up, and, and this is what I quote, this is what she said, and I quote, I can't really explain it, but it's like I've had a bath on the inside. I don't know about you, but that little girl had some good theology right there. When Jesus comes in, he, take, he does a bath on the inside of us. Though our sins are as a scarlet, they are made white as snow. Thank God for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood cleanses us from all of our sins. How many know the devil wants to take that little word out of Scripture? How many know the devil don't like that word all? See, the devil has no problem with you believing that the blood cleanses most sin. But the devil doesn't want you to believe that that it cleanses all sin. Because what the devil wants you to do is live under condemnation. The devil wants you to live under guilt. The devil wants you to live under shame. And he wants you to live under a bondage. Everybody look right up here. Guilt and shame are a bondage. And listen to me, it's not a bondage from God. It is a bondage of the enemy. And the way that you break guilt and shame in your life is to understand that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses me from all of my sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how heinous or how black the sin in your life is. I'm telling you on the authority of the word of God, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin don't worry brother it's holy water amen (laughs) hallelujah the blood cleanses us from all of our sins somebody say all of our sins that little word is so small but it's so powerful and I can't tell you how many people that I counsel as a pastor who struggle with the idea that the blood cleanses me from all of my sins and they're loaded down with guilt, and they're loaded down with shame, and the devil brings up your past, and he brings uh, these haunting memories. How many know that when the devil brings up your past, you just got to remind him of his future, and you got to take him back to the blood, and you got to take him back to the word of God, and you got to take him back to the promises of scripture, that, that if I confess my sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The blood, man, I don't know about you, But that's precious blood to me. Because the blood not only redeems us, but it cleanses us. If you believe it, shout a big amen. Amen. Last but not least, the blood of Jesus empowers us. The blood of Jesus empowers us. Revelation 12 and 11 says, And they overcame him, being the adversary, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of of our testimony." We overcome the enemy, don't miss this, by the blood of the Lamb 
And by the word of our testimony, the blood of Jesus Christ makes us victors over the enemy. Everybody look right up here. Because of the blood, I want you to get this. Because of the blood Jesus shed on Calvary, we are victors, not victims. Listen, we are not victims as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some people that I know, they live with a victim mentality. Everything that's wrong in their life is the fault of someone else. By the way, we're living in a generation of kids that, that are brought up with a victim mentality. Everything that's wrong in their life is the, is the fault of their mom and dad. Everybody look right up here. Mom and dad are never going to be perfect. You can only get away with bl blaming mom and dad for so much stuff. Amen. Amen. And the reality is, is that the blood of Jesus Christ, it takes us from being a victim and makes us a victor. Why? Because we overcome the enemy. We do have an adversary. We have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But the way we overcome him is through the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We are not victims. We are victors in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we've got to lose this victim mentality. We've got to lose this idea that, that we are the way that we are by the fault of someone else. The enemy wants you to, to develop this victim mentality, but we are victors through the blood. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Jesus provided eternal victory over Satan through the blood and at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we overcome? Let me give you three quick things that I'm done. I'm absolutely done this morning with what God has to say. Don't let the devil win the battle in your mind. Don't let the devil, your, do you understand your mind is a battlefield? Your mind is an absolute battlefield for the enemy. But I'm going to tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ empowers you and gives you victory over the enemy's battle with your mind. Mind games. The most feedback that I've ever had in my 10 years of preaching in a sermon series was last October when I preached on mind games, preached on depression, preached on anxiety, preached on guilt, preached on shame, some of these things that we struggle with. How many know that the enemy is after your mind? Why? Because this is what the Bible says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. God wants you to have the mind of Christ, but the enemy wants you to have a confused mind. The enemy wants you to have a chaotic mind. The enemy wants you to have a fearful mind and a discouraged mind. And the Bible tells us Jesus in the greatest commandment, he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your might, with all of your strength. And so if God wants you to love him with all of your mind, no wonder why the enemy is going to attack your mind. Because it's what God wants. God wants your mind. And you fill your mind with scriptures, but, but the enemy is there. And, and, and what I want to say to you is that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ empowers us and gives us victory because the enemy does not want us having victory in our mind. The enemy wants us overwhelmed. And the enemy wants us to, to, to be uh, discouraged uh, with depression and with anxiety and, and, and guilt and shame and all these mind games. The enemy wants us to be so overwhelmed with, in, in the battle of our mind that we are rendered ineffective for Jesus Christ. See, the enemy knows that he can't get us back. God, God has us in his hand. We're secure in the hand of God. But you, that's why the enemy, he, he says, okay, if I can't have you back, I'll go after your mind. And I'll try to ravage your mind to where that I can render you ineffective in the kingdom of God. How many know the blood empowers us over the battle of the mind? Amen. And it's time that we start renewing our mind, as Romans 12 tells us. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we do that? Through the scriptures, through the word of God, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask God's blood to fight our victories and to fight our battles and make us victorious by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Not only do, does the blood empower us over the battle of our mind, but everybody look, look right up here. The blood also empowers us for victory over our marriage. I've never seen a day and age where the devil's battling marriages like he is now. The marriage is under attack. The devil wants to divide and he wants to conquer. And listen, your marriage is sacred and that's what, what Satan hates about your marriage. 
Satan hates the sacredness. Anything that is sacred, Satan is after and he wants to destroy. But understand, it is the blood of Jesus Christ that empowers us and gives us victory in our marriages. And we understand, once the blood has been applied, we understand, guess what? My spouse is not my enemy, the devil's my enemy. See, way too often we're fighting the wrong enemy in marriage. The enemy has confused us and the enemy has deceived us and try to make us think that our spouse is our enemy. But understand this morning that the blood of Christ gives us victory. The blood opens up, and and, and listen, the scripture tells us about how that we should uh, submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A lot of people, they quote that, but they forget the first part of the verse. It's James 4, 7. The first part of the verse says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, then he will flee from you. A lot of people say, well, if you'll just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. No, he won't. You first got to submit to God. You've got to apply the blood. You've got to ask the blood to empower you in the word of your testimony and allow God to open up your eyes to the truth. And listen to me, the marriage is under attack, but understand our spouse is not our enemy. If you believe it, shout a big amen. And the sacredness, God. He wants to preserve the sacredness of your marriage, and and, and he wants uh, to be glorified in your marriage, and that is why the enemy is out to divide and to conquer your marriage. If you believe it, shout a big amen. The battle in your mind, the battle in your marriage, and then he wants to, then the enemy wants to win the battle in your ministry. See, do you know that the enemy always operates in extremes? The devil wants to discourage you in ministry to the point of giving up, or, or, he wants to move to the other, stream, other extreme, way over here, where he'll tempt you to make you think you're more important than you really are and that, that things can't happen without you. How many know that's the snare of the enemy? That's the pitfall of pride, to think that we are, to think of ourselves more highly than we really are. The reality is none of us are anything without Jesus. He's the vine, we are the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so what the enemy does is he likes to operate on the extremes. He wants to make us think that we're too good. He wants us to think that we're we're, we're so good and that that things can't go on without us and that we're too valuable and to think more highly of ourselves. Or he wants to discourage us and overwhelm us to the point of giving up. And listen to me, I don't care what you do for God. There will come a point in time where the enemy will tempt you on both of your extremes. Here's what you need to understand The devil doesn't want you in the center of God's will. God's will for your life is to be active in ministry. That is utilizing the spiritual gifts that God has given you. How do you serve God? You serve God by serving others through the spiritual gift that God has given you. And so the enemy comes, the enemy shows up, and he either discourages you or makes you think that you're uh, better than you really are, and he wants to cause you to fall into the snare of the enemy and the pitfall of pride to where God can't use you and God can't anoint you and God can't bless you and and, and nothing eternal of significance is going to happen and you'll operate in the flesh and just nothing of eternal significance will be done if you think that you're more valuable than you really are and so there's a humility that's needed there and then there's some encouragement that's needed here what God wants us to do is to endure the the temptation of the enemy God wants us to be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that our labor for Jesus is not in vain we need to be steadfast amen but it's the blood it is the blood of Jesus that empowers us in the victory over our ministries. Amen? How many know that it's an easy thing to quit anything? Listen, it's easy. It's easy to throw in the towel on things, isn't it? Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to endure through suffering. You know, the easy thing to do is to throw in the towel in your marriage. It's over. You know what the hard thing is? To work through it. The hard is to to deal with the hurt and the pain and the suffering that is being afflicted on the inside and allow the Spirit of God to do His deep inner work. It's easy to walk away. Amen. It's easy to quit the church. Nothing you're not invested, it's easy. Somebody offended me. 
I'm done. Walking out the door. It amazes me how little it takes for people nowadays to quit on church. It, and it's, it's, what it is is it's immaturity. It's carnality is exactly what it is. Because when we make a covenant with God, we also make a covenant with his bride. We are the bride of Christ, the church. Amen? And the hard thing to do is that when somebody offends you or somebody wrongs you in the church, the hard thing to do is to work through that and to forgive them. But how many know that's what the scripture tells us to do? The right thing to do is always the hardest thing to do, isn't it? But the easy thing to do is to throw in the towel. I want to tell you something. You know who's holding your hand when you're getting ready to throw in the towel? It's not God. The devil's got a hold of your fingers. The devil's telling you, just let it go. Just let it go. Just give up. Just give up. You're not really making a difference in ministry. Just give up, and they'll find someone else to do it. Don't let the devil hold your fingers anymore. It's time to let God take, take a hold of the fingers. Amen? And understand that, that God has called us for such a time as this into our marriages and into our ministries and into the bride of Christ. And the same thing applies uh, to our relationship with our children. The same thing applies to our jobs. Man, it's, it's amazing how easy people quit jobs nowadays. They don't think anything about it. They show up on Monday and I, uh, today's my last day. Well, thanks for your five years. Appreciate that. You with me? Sometimes there are reasons, and, and, and listen, sometimes there are immoral uh, things that happen and cause a person to do that. But I'm going to tell you something. God honors people that are committed. God will honor a people that will work through tough times. And the devil wants you to quit. The devil wants you to give up. He wants to battle. But how many know the blood of Jesus gives us the victory? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder why Peter says that it's precious blood. Because we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. I'm telling you, some of us may need to come and serve notice on the devil. You have no place in my life any longer. You are not going to win the victory in my mind. You're not going to win the victory in my marriage. You are not going to win the victory in my ministry. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm going to overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. Let's bow for prayer today.